I'm Jim Mundorf. This is Lonesome Lands Podcast. Uh, this one I was recorded a while ago, back when I was in Rapid City. I got to sit down with a South Dakota cattle rancher and uh, former Checkoff Beef Board member, Vaughn Meyer. So we talked a lot about the Checkoff and, and the problems that we see with it. And if you're not familiar, um, the second episode I did of the Lonesome Lands podcast that I did, um, I kind of did a deep dive into the Checkoff. So if you want to go back and listen to that one or watch it... Um, and I am on Apple and Spotify. I know almost everybody watches this on YouTube, but I was told I should be mention that I'm all, if you if you don't have time to sit down and watch the YouTube, um, go and and listen to the audio versions. Um, but what the checkoff is is uh, if you're not familiar, is every time cattle are sold in the U.S., one dollar per head of cattle is taken out of the cattleman's check. Um, so the guys raising the cattle, they pay in one dollar per head every time they sell the cattle. And that goes into a fund called the Beef Checkoff. And that money is supposed to be used to increase demand for beef. Um, And the thought being that an increased demand for beef would help the cattle industry. Um, And me and Vaughn talked a lot about all the different problems with the checkoff. And when you get done with these things, you you think back and there's always something you kind of wish you would have said. Um, we talked a lot about the problems, but we didn't get too much into the solution. And and I have talked to Vaughn afterwards, and he agrees with me that the really the solution that the best solution on the table right now is called the Off Act, and it's it's opportunities for fairness in farming, and it's a bill that was introduced by uh, Mike Lee in the Senate. And um, what it does, it talks a lot about um, conflicts of interest. And really what the bill does, I guess, um, is it takes, it makes it so that checkoff money cannot go to lobbyist organizations, which the main organization we have a problem with is National Cattlemen's Beef Association. They are a lobbyist organization. They have a big office in D.C. with a lot of lobbyists um, that, that lobby for different le- legislation. And the, the main thing this off act goes into is it, they talk a lot about conflict of interest and and what that causes with the with these checkoff programs going towards lobbyist organizations and if you get into the ncba they are one gigantic conflict of interest um and one of the reasons i'm kind of glad i held off on this interview is because just last week um that the in the most recent omnibus bill that just passed um was 15 million dollars to pay for electronic identification ear tags um, in case a USDA rule that would mandate them actually comes into effect. And National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which controls the majority of the checkoff money, well, really controls all of the checkoff money and gives itself the majority of it, um, they came out with a press release endorsing that bill and endorsing the $15 million um, to be of taxpayer money to be used to pay for electronic identification ear tags. That is the definition of a conflict of interest. Um, I never say that I'm like the voice of, of a cattleman or any ag industry. I'm not the voice of anyone but myself, but I, I have very confident that if you pulled every cattle producer in the U S um, the overwhelming majority of them would not agree with a mandated electronic ID tag rule. Um, and so, but all of the cattle producers are paying into um, this checkoff bill, this checkoff fund, and and that money is going to lobby to, towards programs that that are against their best interest. Um, another great example of it: over the last three years, we've had all kinds of market trouble in the cattle market, and and there's been multiple legislation introduced um, to reform that and to make it more fair and to create more of a level playing field for all cattle producers and every time that happens the ncba comes out and lobbies against that legislation Um, they are always for things that will help the um the beef packers their corporate partners the beef packers and corporate feedlots the just the big corporations that's what ncba is for and a lot of times those things hurt the small farmers and ranchers um, mandatory country of origin label on all beef. NCBA is against that, and that's something that would help all U.S. ranchers. Um, and like I said, market reform, mandatory ID. NCBA is working hard to get mandatory electronic identification ear tags in all cattle. 
and that is something that um, almost, you know, would would definitely hurt the, the cattle industry and especially small farmers and ranchers. Another thing you'll hear us talk about is ARs, and those are authorization requests. And I thought it'd be kind of helpful to go through this real quick and just kind of give a couple examples of what we're talking about. Um, if you go to the beef checkoff website here and click on, go to the checkoff section, go down to the bottom authorization requests. This is where you can see all of the contractors for the beef checkoff, um, and their requests for money. It's a, it, authorization requests are how they request money from the beef checkoff fund. And so this first category here is consumer information. This first one I thought was a pretty good one to give an example of. This is American Farm Bureau's, um, their one this is their one uh, authorization request, and it's beef-based curriculum resources and on-the-farm STEM. And I think this is a great program, actually. It's how to get the curriculum into schools, and on-the-farm STEM is a Farm Bureau school program. Um, and they are requesting $800,000 for this um for this program their direct costs are 680,000 and you'll hear us talk a lot about implementation fees and this is what the organizations pay themselves and so this money really can't be tracked it's just kind of um, what it costs for them to implement the program and that's $120,000 and then if you go to uh, NCBA's consumer information AR which NCBA has I think seven total ARs all worth millions and millions of dollars. Um, some of their ARs are three-year programs, uh, you know, over $10 million. I mean, I mean it, it just gets nuts when you start adding it up. But So this one is titled Thought Leaders, Experts, Media, and Channel Marketing Engagement. And so that's a good example also of, of their ARs. It's just kind of a, I think people call it a word salad. It's just kind of, you know, you kind of get a vague idea of what they're talking about, but they just kind of throw a bunch of words up there then and try to seem important and, and you know, and, and make it seem like it's worthwhile. But here you have their total of how much they're asking for, $5,900,550. And their direct costs are $2,320,650. What they're paying themselves to implement this program, $3,579,900. And to make this kind of more clear as the difference in associations and how NCBA operates versus how everyone else operates, I put this into a couple of graphs. This is American Farm Bureau here. The blue is their uh, direct costs, and their green is what they pay themselves. So their uh, implementation fee for their cer- consumer information um, AR is 15% of their entire 800000 that they're getting. You go to NCBAs, they're getting almost $6 million, and they're paying themselves three and a half, over $3.5 million of it. 61% just goes straight into NCBA's bank account. There's no tracking of it. Nobody knows what happens to it. This is just cattlemen's money stolen from their pockets, funding a lobbyist organization. Um, and that is really, you'll hear Vaughn talk about, um, this is really how all of their ARs are. He's went through all the numbers. And so this is just a, an excellent example of, of the money laundering kind of fraudulent scheme that they've got going. One last question I think people might have after listening to Vaughn and me talk about this thing is why does the beef board exist? You know, Vaughn was, uh, talks about his time on the beef board, how they really just get flown around and, and sleep through meetings, as you'll hear some of them do. And so I think people will be wondering why the beat board even exists. And I think there's a couple of answers to that. Um, first is NCBA likes to talk about how this is a producer led organization or, um, or the checkoff is controlled by producers and they have producers from all over the country. Um, and so that's one, that's one of the reasons why, you know, they fly them around the country and, and t- send them to these meetings. And the other reason is, um, I think, they, you'll hear about how they sit through these meetings top, put on by NCBA, and it's really just indoctrination. You know, they're they're whining and dining, flying them over the last year. They went to New Orleans, uh, San Diego, Orlando, um, and they go to these meetings. They sit through the meetings put on by the NCBA and the other beef contractors. And, and listen to how wonderful NCBA is. It's an indoctrination to how wonderful NCBA is and how great the beef checkoff works. And all of those people go back to their 
states and their state affiliates and their county affiliates, and they talk about how wonderful the beef checkoff is and how great everything's going, um, and nothing ever really gets looked into. And so that is that is the point of the beef check or the beef board. Um, the the actual decision making of how the checkoff money gets spent is the operating committee. It's a twenty person committee that is really selected by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, the NCBA. And so here is Von Meyer, my very first in in live guest i guess um i have von meyer here i got invited to go up to black hill stock show when we are in rapid city at the monument arena convention center is that what this thing is yes Mm -hmm. um and they gave me a little office that we're tucked away in um and when i got invited i thought this is my opportunity to talk to some people who know a lot more than i do and von meyer was one of the first i thought of um and this so this is podcast number four and von has been uh really involved in the checkoff for how many years oh i I served 11 years uh with my state beef council, and then I was on the Cattlemen's Beef but Board. What, what year was that? Years. What year did you start? I think about 2002. Okay, yeah. so yeah, we're looking at 23 years yeah. or 22 years, I guess. Yeah. Um, and so he's he's forgot more about a lot of this stuff than I'll probably ever know. And so he was. That's the reason I got him here and uh, wanted to talk to him. But he, I was saying podcast number four, and this will be the second one about with a lot of the information about the checkoff, but but that's how important I think it is, and I I know a lot of other people think it's important too. Um, but I wanted to st- start off with kind of where you're where you're from and wh- how you got to ranching and, and what year you started. And Well, I'm, I'm from Riva, South Dakota, which is up in northwest South Dakota there. We were a purebred cow-calf outfit, uh, Angus and Red Angus. Now we're, we're mostly commercial, re, re, running commercial. I have my wife is with with us there, and my son Jeffrey, and I have two daughters that uh, live close by and, and work, and they they help a lot on the ranch along with the grandchildren. And uh, I guess how I got there was my grandfather homesteaded there in 1909, and uh, then my father took over there after World War II, and in there and i guess i just kind of grew up in there and, and kept helping <laughs> all the I, I spent some time at sdsu after high school and ended up in the army for for uh, served there and then came back home mm-hmm. been there ever since what year was that that you came back home 72 i oh, guess okay. 1972 how old are mm-hmm. you or should i not I'm, ask is that um, i don't want to embarrass you i'm the big 74 <laughs> oh okay yeah. yeah and you're still ranching and still ranching yes mm-hmm. and carrying on so are your kids or grand you said you had grandkids or yeah my, my son's helping? there and, and and our daughter's coming to help and and our son-in-laws too quite mm-hmm. often help on the place and and that I, my youngest daughter is a veterinarian at Rushville, Nebraska. So she she comes up and does all of our vet work. And oh, that that's and handy. Keeps us lined up and work, <laughs> working cattle on weekends and stuff. So yeah. Um, out, yeah. So 1909, he homesteaded then. Yes, he, he, he got it. He uh, part of the homestead deal. We do now. He he actually homesteaded north of there, and then it, it, the town was Sorum at that time, South Dakota. Mm-hmm. And then he sold his homestead and moved in and was running the cream station and the egg station at the store where uh-huh. people would bring their stuff in and that and then my actually my grandmother came to that area her her father was a banker and he had homesteaded had a little homestead too and she thought the card games were getting a little good there in the cream station so she bought a quarter of land from a guy and she moved us all out to the ranch and that's <laughs> so i owe my ranching really to my grandmother <laughs> <laughs> um yeah 1909 that'd have been tough and where is it what what town you said you said the town that was called but what what town are you by Riva now Riva yeah okay yeah mm-hmm. right and so this is Western South Dakota mm-hmm. which would 1909 would have been a rough place I suppose um, well, must, tough place to make a go of it I would think must have been a good year that year because they yeah. stayed <laughs> yeah um, well that's cool um, and so then you started on your own in seventy two you said seventy two yeah yeah with my with my, right. my father and, yeah. and that yeah. And then you carried um, it on. Yeah. And so you, um, when did you start getting involved? Like I said, you're a member of South Dakota Stock Growers and RCAF, and, yeah. and you're you kind of are fighting for the industry. When I've talked yeah. about checkoff, I know a lot of people have said, you know, the person you need to talk to is Vaughn Meyer, because <laughs> <No, laughs> no. he's done it for a long time. I don't know about um, that, but... 
We, I basically got involved with RCAF when it when it started. I believe in '98 or okay. thereabouts, and, and the stock was about that same time, or uh-huh. 2000, right after turn turn of the century in there. Yeah. More or less. So 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then you were on the beef board, and yes. when I you know, I did a 50 minute podcast where I tried to explain everything, all the crooked ways that the checkoff works, and anytime I talk about the checkoff, people will comment you know you just need to be involved and get involved and see how it works um and i will say that the people who i've talked to who have been involved have told me that it's kind of a waste of time <laughs> <laughs> um and it's not just yeah. you it's been multiple people who who served mm-hmm. on the beat board but it was all around kind of that same time i think there was a group of you yeah right yeah. um and a number you know i know someone number nebraska south dakota i think somebody in north dakota um, I don't want to name names if they don't want to be talked about, but I know you don't mind. So, um, but yeah, how did you get involved in that? And was it, did you, was there a group of you that decided it, that you were all going to be on the beef board and, and try yeah. to change things or? Well, you're, you're, you're picked by your, your name goes in mm-hmm. by your local, uh, organization. So, South Dakota Stocker has put my name in and I believe the Farm Bureau, I was, I was actually on the beef council or the farm farmers union, excuse me. For South Dakota Farmers Union, that's who I was serving for on on the Beef Council on there. So they all put, put our names in at the same time, and and then then we were picked by by uh, the secretary to, to serve on them. Mm-hmm. And there were there were several people. The stockers had a pretty good record of getting quite a few people in there that were not necessarily the old school in there right. for, for a while. And the goal, like, so you said you started, you joined RCAF South Dakota Stock Growers in around 98, and then so four mm-hmm. years later, you're trying to get on the beef board. Yeah. And, the, like, what would you say, like, your goal at uh, the time of getting on yeah. there? Would I be? really didn't get on the beef board, though, until, uh, I believe it was 2010. Oh, really? So you started and tried yeah. to get on in 22 no, or 02? Or? No, I, that, I was talking about was my, my that that was when they put our names in. But before that, I was with the South Dakota Stock or South okay. Dakota Beef Council, and I I was asked by a guy that stepped off of there for the Farmers Union to, mm-hmm. to serve on there. So, so you got on the Beef Council. Beef Council first for, for 11 years. Mm-hmm. When I became a mem- on the Calamos Beef Board, I... I step aside i said maybe you bring another person in and get them started started on there mm-hmm. so i i as long as i was serving on the national i stepped out and mm-hmm. so that there'd be so re- serving on the uh, state beef council and for people if you this gets kind of convoluted i feel like it's by design but i on if you're confused and you could go back to podcast number two where i kind of explain how state beef councils um, work and they get 50 cents of every checkoff dollar um, and and they're supposed to use it for to work in their state or how they want it and a lot of the state beef councils will donate it to the federation of state beef councils which is the ncba so i guess i wanted to talk more about your time on the beef board and so you got in 02 and then just how did that go uh, with the uh, with the beef council, or are you talking about the beef the beef board the beef board? Yeah, that was about 010 when I when I got on there. Um, and that just it I don't want to interrupt you. Um, that is the national beef checkoff, Cattle, like Cattleman's yeah. Beef Board. Yes, yeah, it's the Cattleman's Beef Board is the beef mm-hmm. checkoff. Um, yep, yeah, it is the beef checkoff. There's was a, when I went in, I believe like a hundred or hundred and two. Yeah, people that are selected on that board, and uh, they assign you to committees and and that that stuff on there. Um, and other other than that, why if if you aren't on there and, and uh, kind of kind of they've checked your thinking out for a year or so, you can run for the operating committee. And the operating committee is made up of ten of us from that were handpicked, and the other ten were were from the federation. Mm-hmm. When the 1996 merger came between the uh, Packers and, and the NCA, and they became mm-hmm. NCBA, why they gave ten seats to the federation. So they would have a complete. Which, to be clear, the federation is the NCBA. It is. A, a, yeah, they call <laughs> the it. NCBA picks ten. They call it a division of NCBA, but right. they don't. They don't form a ten ninety nine of their own or anything like that. It's all, mm-hmm. all infused. It's a nice in name it. to call. Yeah, the, and they, but they don't. It, it makes them feel or makes mm-hmm. them look better, I guess. Yes, when they, when they're not taking the money directly, but it goes to the federation, and yeah. they. Probably have the same bank account or whatever. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. right. And so, yep. sorry. What? 
So Go ahead. anyway, on on the Federation, I kind of lost my thought here, but uh, it my was, fault. It was or not on the Federation. I mean, on the Cattlemen's Beef Board, it, it went along okay. I, I ran for the operating committee, but I did not have a uh, membership with NCBA and. One of the young kids from Arkansas came down that night that was on the committee, and he said, you did very well, but uh, you, you, we couldn't pick you because of some – he wouldn't say why, but I knew why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the thing. You, you just – and at one time, you had to have a, a membership to even get picked to be on, right. on the on the Cattlemen's Beef Board. And I, You had to be, have a, be an NCBA member to yeah, be on the Beef Board. Yeah, and you definitely had to have it to be in the Federation. They weren't going to mm-hmm. take you there. On there, which I is don't, still probably the case. It probably is, but I, mean, I, I know they came it. came down on them, said you can't you can't require that, but mm-hmm. they, they still do their picking and that stuff. So right. it, it's pretty well lined up. But as far as committees, I, I served on several different committees, and and there was never a vote on anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, all all the authorization, the committees would go over what the upcoming authorization uh, requests are going to be. And we met twice a year, once in Denver and then once the winter meeting, wherever they decided they wanted to go roam to. But uh, Which is different now because the summer meeting last year was in San Diego. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I describe it as a paid vacation for beef board members. It is. Yeah. Because uh, everything's taken care of, right? They're pa- flying you there. You're getting your hotel. It's paid by me and you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Right. But anyway, uh, see, the, the – Number one contractor is, of course, your NCBA. Mm-hmm. They they take the, the bulk of, of all the ARs on there. Right. Like like for this year, they they take they they got uh, I believe it was eighty four percent of of all the contractors. Right. Yeah. But the big thing is 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 they they're getting fifty one percent implementation fees. Right. So of of that, they they're dragging home about thirteen million dollars. That that's like paying your hired man yeah once it's crossed that mythical firewall that they they claim is out there that's theirs to spend wherever they want they can go to washington lobby against cool right go and anywhere I, with it i actually did some graphs and this was about i went through last year's checkoff and i i showed and to get into implementation fees um that's money that just ncba gets paid for mm-hmm. um to implement their plan and mm-hmm. it's really it can't be tracked right mm-hmm. it's no. just kind of a paycheck yeah and if you look at ncba's implementation fees versus every other contractor i think every other contractor was around 20 percent implementation fees something like that this or la- you have it this last year it was uh i had 18.8 percent 18 percent is what all other oh. beef contract uh which mm-hmm. how many is there like there's, I think, Ten? six six other contractors okay. or six, seven, <laughs> well, that's less seven than in there. Last yeah, year. yeah. Um, so yeah, and the NCBA is one of those contractors. Mm-hmm. They take fifty percent implementation fee. Everybody else takes eighteen percent implementation fee, which is a big. I mean, that's just money that. And when you, especially when you look at the amount of money that mm-hmm. goes towards yeah. implementation fees, it's just out there. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. money that is gone, right? <laughs> and you don't know yeah. where it's going. When but they have a gigantic office in Washington D.C. They're not supposed to use a single cent of this for lobbying, um, but <laughs> that's where it all ends up. Yeah. Um, well, see, that's that's the point. Is those gals from the from NCBA, who are their number one contractor, they also write those ARs. Right. They they put their money on. They, they there's that firewall, and when they're sitting there working on time. They put their money on that side for for the checkoff. They put their money on the, when they're doing policy on the other side. But who's the oversight to check on them? It, it's you know, somebody above them in the NCBA on the thing. Right. And I've on read the, the ARs, and I I don't know how much time they're really putting in. It's like copy and paste. They all they all read the same. At least the first page is every, all the exact same every, stuff. Every year they're the same same <laughs> thing over and over again. <laughs> the one interesting th- thing I saw was we're going to have to have international flights. Mm-hmm. That's it was in one of the ARs, and they were yeah. very clear about we're going to have to have international flights on this one. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, yeah. I, I suppose that was a mm-hmm. import export deal or something. I don't know, but. Yeah. Um, like how many of the beef board members do you think actually read the ARs? Probably ten percent. <laughs> <laughs> so ten it's, of them. Yeah, yeah, ten of them, and they're on the operating committee. Right. Yeah. Maybe. I'm, I mean, maybe the I'm operating not, committee doesn't read them either. I'm not so sure. Yeah. Because when you read the, through them, like I said, mm-hmm. that last thing about how they're demanding they have international flights and and different stuff like that. There was one where they talk about. Um, 
what did they call them? Like the influencers, these influencers they're going to have on. And I no. looked at who they had, you know, and it was kind of in the news this, or, you know, it, people talked about Sean Baker is probably the biggest promoter of eating beef. He's the carnivore diet, hmm. all those kind of things. And, and they really just shut him out. He, he tried to, he thought, you know, obviously the beef checkoff would be a great partner for him. He realized right. that and went to him and, um, and they really just shut him out because yeah. he's, He's an independent kind of guy, and that's not who they want in there. Exactly. <laughs> so, yep. um, so yeah. So, um, just to go into the ARs a little more. So you, when you went in there and you had your idea of like you got on the committees, and you were probably like a lone wolf yeah. or a lone voice in yeah. those committee meetings. Yeah, there's, um, go ahead. There, there, there's at least twenty to five of, uh, on every committee. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe sometimes thirty. In there, it's it, they're big committees, mm-hmm. and they girls put that on. They, you know, it's like anything else. It's mostly on the overhead, and they run through how this is going to work and how that's going to work and how it's going to influence be, uh, consumers and and all that on there. And and you can glance down the room because it's kind of dark, and I'd say fifty percent were asleep, <laughs> <laughs> sound asleep. <laughs> it was nap time. Is yeah. the committee meeting? Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Uh, how many do you think were NCBA members oh, of the 102? Like, just a guess. How 102? many? 102. Yeah. About 95 or six. Yeah. Yeah. So there was at least. Yeah. So and I'm was, not so sure of the other five or six if they didn't have double membership right. somewhere. Right. Yeah. I might have been the only one that wasn't. No, I know a couple, yeah. couple others weren't. Too, right. But there, but. Yeah. And so even, and so for the people who tell me, you know, you got to get involved. You got to, you got to get on the beef board and go to your state beef council meetings and all which is what you have done for 20 some yep. years mm-hmm. um right right like what would you say to those people well i i would say you're it's a long uphill battle on your right. on your state ones you you probably have more pull and on that you know we mm-hmm. we we worked together and, and did some things we we the state your state beef councils if they keep their 50 cents can do do a lot of good things right. South Dakota was a is a organ a state with f- fewer people and and of course we got the cattle out here so we sent a lot of money to the Northeast Initiative which is the northeastern states yeah New York uh, we worked directly with Pennsylvania and did did some good things there uh, you know promoting beef and and that and in fact uh, quite a few I never made it but Sarah quite a few of our council would go out and wor- help them work the North uh, New York uh, State Fair which is a huge event. And and uh, promote beef there yeah. and that, and I'll tell you one one thing that you know if we've gone through a lot of ARs and stuff. There's there's never money that comes back. They always mm-hmm. make sure they spend it. Yeah. One time we allocated money to New York, and in the fall we got a check back. I believe uh, roughly twenty three hundred dollars of unused money. Now that that really. That's an honest deal when you yeah. can promote promote there. And it's, to be clear, I think we just kept saying ARs. Those are authorization requests. So when somebody wants beef checkoff money, they they uh, put in an authorization request. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're talking about the northeast. What it's the northeast. I don't know. There's some. In, it's one of the ARs that um, goes where the money goes to the northeast because. Um, you know, we have the state beef council money that all goes to the these states where we raise a lot of cattle, um, and then for the northeast AR, you can those states can send their money um, yeah. to oh. the states that don't raise a lot of cattle, which really is where where it belongs. Yeah, it really isn't an AR though. That, uh, it's it's a, what they call the northeast initiative. R- initiative. It's advertising yeah. that, and it's mostly state monies that go go right. there. Because states can allocate exactly where they money will, yeah. want their money to go, which very few do. Yeah, and there's a question <laughs> whether the federation maybe kicks some back to that occasionally. Yeah, I, I don't know. Right. On that because case. on one of the things I was criticizing the checkoff, and somebody sent me a program from Colorado, and it was um, beef sticks for schools or mm-hmm. something like that. And I thought that is an awesome program that the checkoff does fund in mm-hmm. Colorado. Right. But right now we have. You know that program. If people were really paying attention, right now in New York City, um, meat has been taken off the menu for New York City public schools for at least two days out of the school week, yeah. where they don't allow meat on the menu. It's meatless Mondays, and then I think it's vegan Fridays is what they call. So if the beef checkoff actually would do their job, and you already have this beef stick. 
for schools program in Colorado, why would not, why would, you know, you're crazy not to expand that into New York. I've always thought that. Like if we, you know, even if we put, you know, 80% of the money just towards these, you know, New York and California where they're trying to ban meat for their residents, um, that's really where it belongs. But Mm -hmm. it ends up in, you know, a D.C. lobbyist office. (laughs) Well, see, and that's, that's one of the problems with the whole checkoff is, the contractors have to be like-minded organizations, and, and it used to be they had to be before 1984 when it came into being. Now they've dropped that that date, and they've fic- picked up some others on there. I fought all the time I was on there to try and get it opened up to private enterprise. Mm-hmm. They always claimed they needed another dollar, you know, but inflation is eating up our dollar. Well, you can get a lot more efficiencies if you got private enterprises out there competing. Right. And, and you can come up with a lot of new ideas. Which goes back to what everybody thinks of with the beef checkoff is beef is what's for dinner, yeah, right? And right. that was created by an advertising agency. I wish I could remember the name because they're a famous one. Um, yeah. they cre- uh, the same advertising agency made the Michelin Man. Mm-hmm. I think maybe the Pillsbury Doughboy. Yeah. They came up with all those things. And, and then they came up with beef, it's what's for dinner. And that was, mm, I'm thinking mid-90s? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, about mid-90s. I was going to say Sam, 96. Sam Elliott, I thought he was even yeah. early, early in that. But yeah, yeah I think it was maybe earlier than that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, and then that's what NCBA keeps pushing out year after year. And I think about, mm-hmm. like, you look at these big marketing Firms or even just these big corporations like Coca-Cola. How many slogans have they had since we've had beef? It's what's right. for dinner, you know. We have the same thing, and it is recognizable, yeah. which is good. But you also look at where it comes from. It came from a private advertising corporation that they would not even allow that to ever happen now. Yeah, exactly. You know? So the best thing for the beef checkoff is is something that would never happen again. The way things mm-hmm. are set up. Right. Exactly. Yeah. There, but and so. Like you said, you're on. You, you do these committee meetings, right? Yes. And mm-hmm. as a, um, as on the beef board, and then, what does that influence? I mean, what's even the point? Because to me, oh. it's like you have these ten people, oh, twenty people who are gonna def- decide. So. Yeah, de- definitely to make us feel good. Right. On the whole thing, you know, why right. justify having a hundred members out there? Right. On there is, is basically what it and is. And do they tell you about what a great job you're doing? Oh, that's what I assume. Yeah. Or what a great we, job NCBA is doing. Probably the others got that told. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on there, but yeah, no, it, it is. Yeah, it's a, you yeah. know, and, and we 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 had uh, opening sessions, closing sessions, and all that, and they they had speakers in there on them every year. Every year they would bring somebody in, like, uh, oh, I can't say names right now, but they, the guy that. Uh, was over in Afghanistan and, and mm-hmm. got attacked. He spoke to us, and the guy that climbed the Himalayas. Uh, yeah, I've seen that, like a football player. Somebody yeah, was yeah. on a couple Pros, years ago. They always they always had people like right. that come and in. And guys aren't always cheap to have come no, in and talk no. to you. No, <laughs> no, spend a lot of money on that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but they make you feel good, right? Yeah, Ex- yeah, it was basically yeah. feel good. That's already. another. Per- I mm-hmm. I yeah. told this story. I think in the last one, um, the another person who got on the beef board and they. Um, they went in to change things. They didn't like how NCB operated, and they told me, the thing about NCBA is they sure know how to throw a hell of a party. Yep. Mm-hmm. And so you go down, right? Like this week right now mm-hmm. is the checkoff meetings at the NCBA National Convention in Orlando, Florida, where those beef board members got a free plane ticket, free hotel room, and they're, part, they're in on all the parties yep. down there. Mm-hmm. And so it, what you have to do to be on the beef board and to continue to be on the beef board is agree and get along and you'll be invited to the next party yep, <laughs> right exactly. um, that's how i've been told that's what i've been mm, told the person lot. that told me about how they throw a hell of a party is i could tell like they kind of wanted to go back to the party <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and but, so no it's there's a lot of overrun there right and that's what keeps people coming i guess yeah on the thing keep, i mean keep, that's what i've said about ncba yeah. they they're a lobbyist organization, and people mm-hmm. think of that as they're lobbying um, mm-hmm. politicians all the time. But I think one, what they really do a good job of is lobbying their own members. Yeah. It's just so Indeed. that they're kind of blind to what's going on. Exactly, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, yeah. you and, s- go ahead. And and same with your checkoff. You know, if, if you, you go to my, my beef checkoff and look that up, you know, they'll, they'll tell you what a good job you're doing as a farmer or rancher. Mm-hmm. and. 
and how, how important just, you it, are. It's, yeah, very read read what they cover, mm-hmm. you know, and the thousands of members that they have. Well, yes, every organization that they they claim as a sub organization, mm-hmm. they're counting members. Every right, every feed truck driver out there on that. And <laughs> there's a lot of lot of lot of uh, big feed lots and ranches that the employees either either are members or right. or not or they yeah. don't work there on the thing. And I'm not. They, I mean, that's paid membership by the. Mm-hmm. And stuff like right, that. and yeah. that ain't cheap. No, I think a membership is what. I mean, it oh, depends how many cows. How many right? cattle? Yeah, it could run thousands. I, I was a member at one time. Yeah, of, of NCBA, probably in '84 or '5, somewhere mm-hmm. in there. And uh, basically, it was, I think it was if it was the Canadian cow issue or whatever, and they sent sent me my uh, dues or, or whatever my membership deal and i just wrote on there that i absolutely wouldn't go join, join an outfit like that and <laughs> i think i got at least 10 people from all over the united states called me oh really and I, yeah it's high pressure uh-huh they, they were, wanted you, oh so they called you to try to get you to sign to up stay back on and pay my dues <laughs> on there <laughs> and they were looking up how much it cost to go to the convention yeah. last night and there was one like a full package to go to every day of the convention was over a thousand dollars yeah it's 1300 bucks i think they said mm-hmm. which is i yeah. couldn't believe it but yeah. i i know somebody that um works a trade show at the convention and i asked him one time like who goes to this deal and he said um it's mostly like industry people mm-hmm. it's industry people and it's big corporate feed lots you know who have yep. an office building and they send everybody in the office to the party yeah um but he said it's very few actual you know yeah. grassroots yeah. independent type of people yeah and so except yeah. for you know your state cattlemen's groups mm-hmm. you know they, they, they always them. have to be a good little affiliate so they get mm-hmm. sent to the party for free yeah. i yeah. think or most, they use their state beef council money to go do it or most of your breed associations right. them are, are signed up with them you know they yeah in there and they get in there too no oh, yeah um so you said you worked on or you have looked at the 2024 yes uh, mm-hmm. which i haven't looked at at all right mm-hmm. um is it, it are there are less contractors and so when we say contractors those are the people who submit authorization requests and and get approved they're approved um and if you look through the list of contractors it's really i think they're all lobbyists except for the actual beef board they get a couple million bucks yeah. um usually mm-hmm. for what they call producer what is it producer information or something yeah, like that i guess it it's is. how they advertise in all the magazines and well <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the reason is is when I that's only been the last uh, I suppose four years, five years. It used to be that they they're required to to do the 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 uh, office work and and right. that for less than three percent. That's in that's in the act in the order, <laughs> but it's over it's running over. So the only way they could take care of inflation was to start giving them an authorization request too, on there. Yeah, so and uh, to go back. Uh, they do the people in the office do work i should talk about the book mm-hmm. um a buck ahead was was written by i'm, I'm gonna diane i i'm gonna screw her last name up but goom gum <laughs> oh, i wish i could say it right i i don't know i've never heard it said so because i just t- i message her back and forth yeah, and i talked to her some but she was a full-time um beef board employee yeah mm-hmm. um and and she wrote a book about how corrupt you know it was kind of the history of the checkoff and it's called a buck ahead she wrote it with someone else's and, name yeah, i'm not gonna remember I'm, she's from nebraska and i know her um, i should I have should. the book sitting in front of me but um but yeah they wrote this book about and she was like a journalist who had covered the checkoff and mm. for years yeah and and they got together and wrote kind of a history of the beef checkoff and to give you an idea of how that works yeah that was a beef board employee who wrote a book about mm. how what a mess it is really yeah um, what's going on in there right and it's and so um the 24 checkoff has anything changed not much except for they're running out of money because the cow herd numbers are down they aren't getting their the oh, buck right. like that that's why they're they're basically up to 51.4 percent implementation fees every year while i was on that board up until the last few years it was always their implementation fees would run 20 uh four 39 to 42 percent would be balancing right on 40 percent average all the other uh, contractors would be a flat 20 percent 
they just threw so it. So they were threw, double. They threw it in at 20%. And now they're like now four it's, or, Now yeah. it's starting to creep up, and the others are getting less because they're throwing them a smaller pie. Yeah, because they they're, 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 they're running it. They need it. Yeah. yeah, and they need it because they have. I was shocked when I was on the beef board. One year, the American Cattle Women put in a, it wasn't a huge one, and there was a lot of complaints by NCB about it. And I uh, asked some people, I said, what's going on here? And they said, well, we just got caught, and then you probably remember that. Uh, they sent uh, Forrest Roberts on a little vacation and his wife and stuff down there, and they had to pay up on that and, and several other things. And they got caught and had to pay back over, over $270,000. Oh, right. And they were, they were it needing, was the audit or whatever. needing funds yeah. on there. That deal there, when they audited those books, they audited the equivalent of nine days. Right. And they, and found, they found 270,000 270, that were misused, right? And actually, then there were some more added. It was closer to 330,000 before they got done. But yeah. if they can do that in any, on a random nine days. A, 30, a third of a million dollars. It's, it's time that we've <laughs> in probably. In nine days. In nine days. Misused. And it hasn't been audited since, right? Nope. nope nothing since. Yeah. On there. Because they won't allow it. And they're yeah. still partnered with USDA. USDA would have to be the one to. To audit them, right? Yes. Or to yeah, to and, initiate and, to audit. And there's no USDA would, and or they'd go through the uh, federal uh, auditing there mm-hmm. on the deal. But there's there's no oversight with USDA. They're supposed right. to have the oversight there. And the reason there isn't, it's 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 a revolving door policy there. Yeah. Because and I mean to go on that. I've talked about this some this, or I posted something about that this week last year. I think it was February. The USDA gave NCBA four hundred and forty-five thousand some odd dollars to, for hmm. um, the yeah. Well, I'm trying to think of what it was called, but beef security system or something like that. But what it was was for EID tags. Yeah, it was to get their members in on EID tags. It was a payoff, close to half a million dollars to get all their members, you know, in on these EID electronic identification tags for cattle. Um, and now here we are a year later, and they're yeah. mm-hmm. who know, today's the day where they're going to vote on it. But who know? And so, yeah. I I just wish people would would pay more attention to that kind of stuff because yeah, the yeah. USDA is just a partner, a partner in the yeah. whole in the corruption, yeah. Yeah. in the scam, really. When, when people term out and one position, they go over to the other group and back, and right. even our even our secretary, you know, uh, mm-hmm. when when their party didn't get in why he went to work for almost a million dollars a year from the dairy right association and now he's back again yeah and while he was working for the dairy association i wonder how many dairy farms went under that was a rough time back then (laughs) yeah Yeah. and he was making a million bucks a year right and then he gets done and he goes straight into secretary of agriculture right um and that was the other thing i was i think i was starting to say it but all when we were talking about the contractors that, that they're all lobbyists yeah i said they're all lobbyists except for the beef board and then, is there another one that's not a lobbyist? But I'm pretty sure there. Well, you've got U.S. MEF. Yeah, which is. Um, but U.S. MEF's money, they they get roughly nine to ten thousand million a year. Right. Yeah, that, they're the second highest. And to be clear, you that's United States Meat Export Federation. Export Federation. Right. Yes. And yeah, so they're the second highest amount contractor, um, mm-hmm. which. 10 million bucks versus the highest is how much how much do you have the total for ncba this year for ncba this year they're uh 20 twenty five thousand four hundred five. Twenty five million. Twenty five million four hundred five thousand. yeah that's, that's right. a little better on there um uh, and it's been as high as well it was in 2017 it was 32 million right. plus 32 million. and yeah. it's been up around 37 38 depending on the numbers on there but they see the key thing on on US MEF is their their money comes through an AR that that N, NCBA writes and and wins or mm-hmm. they're awarded it to themselves and we found out when we we're in Denver that that 10 or 8 8 million 9 million whatever it was that year goes through them and they take an implementation fee out on before they pass it on to them <laughs> and our NCBA que- does yeah and our question was why why are you doing that well we have to handle that you know, it's tough work to write a check and, and put one in your bank and write another one on there. <laughs> yeah. And so that brings me also that the importers get seats on the checkoff, too. Right. So, and that that's based on how many cattle actually get imported. Yeah. So the more cattle that get imported, the more seats on the checkoff. Yes. Um, 
they get, which seems completely backwards because it gives right. a motivation yes. for Im, you know to import more cattle, mm-hmm. and then they get more of a say over yeah. how cattle you know cattle guys money gets spent. It's right. just so they, completely backwards. They convert the tonnage of meat into a cow, cow right. calf, and, yeah. and uh, last they raised that up while I was there, and it's probably changed since then. I believe it's nine hundred and sixty pounds. It gives, per, it gives them an animal sold on, right. there, on the deal. Yeah. So and, they are also contributing. And 950 right. pounds, yeah. they throw a dollar in. But if you go back per. to the, and I don't mean to interrupt you here, but if you go back to the original act in the order when we, when it was to come in, it says that it, it is to uh, enhance, and all, all checkoffs say the same thing, enhance the products for the producers, you know, to, to, ma- to make their markets better, is mm-hmm. what it says. Well, if the importers are paying it in, what? Who are the producers? Right. Those are the, technically the ones that are paying the dollar are, are the uh, uh, importers themselves, or whatever. And, and we don't know if any of the producers over in the other countries are getting getting any of that uh, benefit to right. the, to their markets on there. Yeah. So technically, if if they're not producers and they're paying a dollar in, it's not legal. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's so much at the begin, like you. The, the original order also says to expand cattle markets. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. And right now we got the livestock, the LMA guy, Livestock Marketing Association, which is really your sale barn operators, and they're all wound up. They don't want to do these EID tags. But I wish they would also realize that, you know, NCBA this year is getting $25 million. That is part of it is supposed to go to enhancing um, – you know, creating markets. What markets. if what if some of that money could go towards, you know, these sale barns and promoting selling your cattle not direct but through right. sale barns. Yes. Um that kind of stuff. They're really missing out on that deal because they've kind of decided to go along and they get some of the checkoff money, don't they, LMA? Yeah. Through something. They're, they, they, they're, they're listed somewhere yeah, in there. They, might, they? they were in, they were in there. I don't know if they're in on the last one or not this okay. last year. Yeah. On there, I guess I did. But they, I was just talking. Um, they're also the organization that sued them and took them to the Supreme Court and, right. and ended up losing because they said mm-hmm. it was government speech or it wasn't government speech, something about that. But yeah, oh. if you if you're curious about that, that buck ahead really goes into every single little thing that went on during right. that mm-hmm. during that court case. Yeah. The contractors are lobbyists. And, and when you think about that in the USDA, you know, one of the contractors, North American Meat Institute, which is the number one con- uh, lobbyist organization for beef packers. Mm-hmm. Um, and anything, mm-hmm. you know, like I talked about, trying to expand cattle markets, any sort of cattle market regulation we've tried over the past few years, there's been all kinds of things introduced in Senate um, hearings mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But the North American Meat Institute has their lobbyists there. That are sending out letters and knocking on doors and um, to try to get all that stuff stopped and and cattle producers are funding funding them partly through the checkoff. Right. Um, but yeah, the, and all the contractors there, and a big issue for us for our calf and South Dakota stock growers is M Cool NCBA <laughs> the, the Meat Export uh, our Federation was even on that I believe North American uh, Meat uh, Import uh, what it, MICA. And Farm Bureau were all key ones listed on the uh, su- uh, suit. Well, it was a suit or a draft, I guess you'd call it, to the House of Representatives to start stop defunding Cool, and, and which eventually killed Cool on there. Right. And every one of them's a contractor here to yeah. a, to an organization. And also, like the same along the same lines, um, Thomas Massey showed an email. Who's a House of Representatives for Kentucky? He showed an email last year about EID. So you got to mm-hmm. think it's the same thing. Farm Bureau is lobbying for electronic identification, right. um, and they never told their members. Nope. They, it wasn't a membership deal. It was because they're partnered up in this thing, yeah. um, and everything else. You know, it, mm-hmm. when you really start looking at big ag, it's all just a good old boys club, um, mm-hmm. a group of guys who've all decided they're going to support each other. Um, with its Farm Bureau supports NCBA on mm-hmm. all this stuff, they wouldn't come out. They wouldn't be for any sort of market regulation. They're, now they're lobbying for EID tags. They were against mandatory country origin label. Right. Yeah, it's just a mess. It, so It is. It really is. We've lost, as Bill mentioned this morning, a half a million producers since since we had our checkoff. Right. We've lost over 70,000 independent farmer feeders. Mm-hmm. And, and we've uh, lost, what is it, about 9 million cows are, right. are down on our numbers. 
So if if this was, if our checkoff was doing what it's supposed to do, we, everybody'd be wanting to get in. They wouldn't be mm-hmm. wanting to ex- exit the industry on that thing. You know, right. we, we'd all be living real good because that, you know, when when the checkoff was started and and it in. The 70s, we had neighbors that were running down there and before it got turned over to NCA, and they said, well, we'll handle this for, for you guys, But and they gladly gave up. They had ranches to run. But before it started, you know, you, you looked at all the big people that advertised, like in those cases, it was the tobacco companies and, and uh, Ford Motors and all that. They were doing well. You know, times mm-hmm. were good. And we, we expected that putting some money out, and having some good advertising programs was going to make us money on the thing before it all got uh, got stolen. Right. In ni- mm. Go ahead. In 1977, when, when they first started working trying to get the, the deal through, in 1977, that was the first amendment to, to, there was only ever two amendments to what they were working on. In 1977, that's when they added, they said, a simple, simple amendment, the beef importers will add a dollar ahead too Mm -hmm. and that opened the door for imports right Mm -hmm. then and there and captive supplies Mm -hmm. against us then the second one came about 1982 and they couldn't get it passed so they dropped it from two-thirds to a simple majority and then it passed (laughs) after that changed the rule those are the only two amendments that were ever to the original yeah bill they were trying to put in and you talk about what's going on now with all the losses and i've drove seven and a half hours to get up here so i had a lot of time to think and i was thinking about um, I talked today about this sustainability and this carbon crap um, that they're trying to push now. And, and I thought, you know, what, what should we really be talking about? And right now we're sitting at a time when our cattle herd is at the smallest, the smallest size it's been in the U.S. Since, for 50 years, since the 70s. Mm-hmm. And we have, I don't know how many beef packing plants coming online here in the next Right. couple years yeah. there's a giant one north platte big one right next to me um yeah. south of council bluffs iowa there's one in st louis i think so mm-hmm. i think we're looking at like four or five yeah. big packing plants that right. are going to come online and we don't have any cattle yeah i mean no, don't. that's the number one issue that everybody right. should be talking about and right now they're Today is the vote on electronic ID tags at the number at the number National Cattlemen's Beef Association convention, and the whole convention, all these speakers are all about sustainability and carbon markets and all that BS. When I mean, we're looking at a, you know, these packing plants are going to get built, and what what are they going to do? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a exactly. serious issue that nobody's talking about. Yeah. Um, and you know, we could have we got. Eighty million dollars a year, where we could that should be going to people who are who really care about that kind of thing. Like we could, we should really be ramping the herd up. Yeah, we should be pushing, you know, grazing CRP. Those kind of programs um, it should be the number one issue. Yeah. Is how to get more cattle and how to expand the market, get create a competitive marketplace um, to where we can get fair prices and, and it would bring more people in instead of pushing them out. But right. sustainability should be keeping more producers on the land out there. Right. And sustainability should be feeding feeding your consumers and, and feeding them healthy and clean and safe food. And the only only way to do that is, is to keep those producers out there and, and with the restrictions we have here in the United States and feed, feeding them yeah. food, food that, that has been inspected and improved instead of bringing cheap imports in so that some – Corporation can can make profit off of right. off of cheap food on on the American consumer. Yeah, and I was talking there. for that for that thing I did. I looked at the Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, their website, and the number right. one their number one priority they said was stopping the tropical deforestation for cattle production. Yeah. Um, but they don't have anything about mandatory country of origin labeling. No. Like any idiot mm-hmm. yeah. who you know, if you want to stop that deforestation, well, we're not. Mm-hmm. destroying tropical forests in the yeah. u.s so yeah. you slap a you know you slap an actual country of origin label on your meat package and when you pick up the meat package and it says u.s you know you're not tearing down tropical forests True. if mm-hmm. that was your number one priority you would do it and it just goes to right. show what a scam that all this all this sustainable round tables are and, yeah. and the whole sustainable yeah, and they they movement. got they got members in there that are serious about eliminating all animal mm-hmm. food right, groups yeah. in there and stuff. So, you know, and here here we got our checkoff beef checkoff was a member of them for quite a few years. Everybody says, well, you got to go along with them. No, you you don't have to. Right. You don't have. To. 
that that shows that you you're accepting the lie as, right. you, as yeah. you said this morning <laughs> right you know. yeah yeah and that's it's crazy that when you see the kind of their membership and who and who goes along with that and it's like you said too the, the end of these feedlots. I grew up in Iowa in the 90s, and we had we could feed 300 head of cows at our place, and mm-hmm. Iowa was filled with 300 head cow feedlots. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and now all of those are gone, really, most of them. They've either mm-hmm. turned into 5,000 head feedlots or they're gone. Yep. And mm-hmm. where those cattle went to was western Kansas, yep. Texas Panhandle, gigantic, you know, yep. 100,000 head, 50,000 head. The biggest feeder in the country is... Mm-hmm. million head on feed yeah. um, and how sustainable is that yeah. when you think about mm-hmm. how we were growing yeah. everything our cattle were eating across the fence from our cattle yeah. and now they're trucking it from mm-hmm. our from yeah. our from our fields yeah. to the I, Texas Panhandle or New Mexico yeah. or Western and Kansas I think, I think Iowa's, Iowa is quite similar to South Dakota too where as soon as those small uh, independent family farms left and that stuff, look at look at the local towns. Oh yeah, they're they're dried up. There's mm-hmm. there's hardly anything there other than a few medical facilities and. Well, you can buy a lot of meth. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> used to be able to buy. Used to have a hardware store and a bowling. Like I'm yeah. thinking of mine. You yeah. know, used to have all kinds of stores down. Yeah. And now the only yeah. thing they sell is meth. <laughs> yeah. Well, they used to be implement dealers in every every town. Oh, yeah. There isn't anymore. Yeah, and welding and shops yep. and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff, right. but. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's the local economy is the rural economy. If they don't take care of their farmers and ranchers out here, and that's the other thing, just make the markets good. Farmers and ranchers right. don't want a handout. Mm-hmm. And every time the government turns around, oh, we're going to give you another uh, program on this, this, and that. You know, come over to your local office and sign up on that. Mm-hmm. Farmers and ranchers really want is just a fair income, right? And they'll, they'll take care of themselves. They'll feed America. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I feel like that's pretty good. You had, did you have anything else? Any specific points you wanted to I get think, to? Or? I think that's pretty much it. All right. <laughs> Covered about everything. Take yeah. care of them and they'll feed America. I feel like that's a pretty okay. good place yeah. to end it. So oh, thank okay. you for coming okay. on. And Well, thank you. We appreciate yeah. everything you do for us. And, and that you bet. Got to keep the, getting that word out there. And you're yeah. doing a good job. I'm trying. <laughs> on there. All right. Big thanks to Vaughn Meyer for, for uh, sitting down with me there. And another big thanks to South Dakota Stock Growers and also RCAF for being great hosts. Um, for my time up in Rapid City and everybody I met up there it was great to meet everybody and and it couldn't have, couldn't have been a better time. Um, I also want to thank uh, this is the book a buck ahead Lisa Zaleski and Diane Gemeyer I believe um, hopefully I know that's better than what I said in the podcast but um, sorry for screwing your names up. Diane's the one who had worked um, for I think 15 years as a full time beef checkoff. Uh, employee and and then Lisa was a investigative journalist um, in agriculture and mainly covering the beef industry for I think over 20 years and so both of them have have kind of seen the history of the corruption and how the beef checkoff operates and they really wrote a detailed detailed history of of how that works in that book if you're interested um, thanks also to everybody that's been listening and sharing the videos and l- the liking and subscribing and rating review, all that kind of stuff. It really helps. And, and we're, we're growing there. Each one of these I do, I think more and more people are, are watching and it's getting out there. So I really appreciate everybody doing that. If you want to help more, there is a, I've got a subscribe page on lonesomelands.com. If you go there, click subscribe at the top of the page and you can kind of see, how you can help out to keep keep me doing this and, and keep this thing growing. Um, this podcast was brought to you by Lonesome Land. So if you are looking for, um, if anyone would, would like to advertise on the podcast, um, you can email jim at lonesomelands.com. Um, I also have a merch page there and you can go and everything kind of helps out to, to just keep these kind of things going and, and keep this thing growing and getting the word out there. Um, these are important things, I think, and hopefully... Hopefully it's getting out there to people. Um, So I got another one planned here. Should be a good one. Stay tuned.